All right, so a sermon this morning, actually, you know, it's kind of funny, I, I, it's, it doesn't feel like I've been pastoring for as long as, as I have at this point. I think about things I, I think would be good to preach on, or I study, I'm trying to figure out what I want to preach for, for service, and then, you know, oftentimes I, I don't like just repeating sermons, I don't like repeating myself, I don't like preaching a lot of the same things, but oftentimes it's, it's necessary, it's needful, and I've already re-preached some things here that, that are more to help maintain the things we need to be focused on because they're more relevant on a, on a, on a frequent basis, I guess you could say. I'm going to be teaching a more doctrinal sermon today, and um, these, I, I, some of these, this isn't the most important doctrine. I haven't, when I look back, I knew I'd preach this before, but I, when I look back, I was like, wow, I didn't preach this since 2014. So I don't think most people here are probably going back to 2014 to listen to my sermons from Word of Truth. So we're going to preach this this morning. Um, I don't know what, what everybody here believes about this, but I want to, I'm going to preach it nonetheless and, and show you from the Bible why I believe, what I believe about the book of life and, uh, you know, the Lamb's book of life, the book of life we read about in scripture. We're going to go looking at, uh, all the references, many of the references to the book of life in scripture. And I'm going to show you, and just, just right off the bat, before I prove everything, I'm going to show you, that I believe that every name for every person starts off in the book of life, that it begins in the book of life, and that it doesn't get added when a person gets saved. I believe they only get removed. And I'm going to show you that from Scripture. We're going to, we're going to look at all the references. We're going to get to that a little bit later. But I'm going to start off showing you there's, there's, there's a lot of other doctrines and things that, that will play into this concept and, and I want to show you that, that all of this fits together and makes sense. And we started off, first of all, in Genesis chapter 3, which, of course, uh, a very famous passage where we have Adam and Eve, where Eve eats of the forbidden fruit, Adam eats of the forbidden fruit, and, they're, and they get judged by this, and they get kicked out of the Garden of Eden, right? Now, you're in chapter 3. Flip back to chapter 2 real briefly. And look at verse number 16. We're going to see God's commandment to Adam even before he, made, he created Eve. Verse number 16 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, God's commandment is very clear. What he said is very clear. Right? He says, don't eat of it. And he says, in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. And, and he's, it's very explicit. It, 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 it doesn't use language. God didn't use language of like, you know, well, if you eat, you'll deserve death. Or you'll get, to, you know, like, like he doesn't make it more vague. He says that the judgment's going to happen the very day that you eat of it. And the reason why I'm making a point of that is because we just read Genesis chapter 3. And if you look back to where, you know, uh, Eve is, is deceived by the serpent, she eats of the fruit, Adam eats of the fruit, what happens? Their eyes are opened, but did they physically die in that day? No, because then, then they hide themselves, they hear the Lord, they go hide, and they're confronted by God, and God puts these curses on them, but none of them physically just fall down dead, or anything like that. That doesn't happen. In fact, Adam and Eve continue to live physically for many, many years, hundreds of years later, right? So that's important to understand because, first of all, does that mean, well, was God lying? Is God's word not true? Of course not. But the death that took place, he wasn't referring to a physical death. And this is something that, you know, it's, it's very simple. This is pretty basic. We explain this when we go out soul winning. You know, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Oftentimes, it's one of the first verses we show to people that, hey, we're all sinners, and this is the wages of sin. It's death. And just as we believe that, you know, yeah, the wage, we're all going to physically die one day. And I usually explain this to me. We're all, physically, we're all going to die one day. But the wages of sin, that death is, is different than just physically dying. Just like the judgment that God was giving on them eating of the, of the fruit of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, that judgment was not 
Like, it wasn't just a physical death punishment on that because in the day they died. And you know what? I'll tell you right now, in that day they did die. But the death was a spiritual death, not a physical death. Now, and this is going to be important because there's going to be other, other scriptures that are going to play into this. How does this work into the, into the, um, the book of life? We'll get, in, we'll get into that soon. Now, of course, Satan deceives Eve in chapter 3, saying, well, thou shalt not surely die. But what did God say? Thou shalt surely die. So who are you going to believe, Satan or the Lord, right? Of course, they did surely die. Now, God gives them some curses after they eat. And then... Um, I want you to look down there in chapter 3. After he, after he gives all the curses, down at verse number 20, the Bible says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And look at verse number 21. The Bible says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Because you remember when they, when they ate, and I'm not going to reread all these verses. We, we just read the whole passage. They, they knew that they were naked after they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because before that, they didn't, it, they didn't know that anything about the shame of nakedness or anything like that. They were innocent. In a similar fashion that children today, you know, young children, they'll, they could run around naked, and th it doesn't matter to them. It's, there, there's something that they just don't, they don't care about it, right? It's not until you reach a certain age where you start really thinking like, oh, man, I don't, you know, I, I shouldn't be exposed and have my nudity shown before other people, right? That, that's, that's shameful. I don't want people to see me uncovered or naked. Uh, it's the same way Adam and Eve. Now, they were physically created adults, but they still had that innocence and, and you know, maintain that innocence until the day that, that sin was found in them, until they ate of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's when, once they had that knowledge, then they understood and they're like, wow, Okay, we're naked, we need to be covered, and, um, and all that. Now, God provided a covering for them, because now they know that they need to be covered, and God provided that covering. But what's interesting about this covering, because it's not just that simple, oh, well, just God just gave them a covering, right? Because what they did first is they tried to cover themselves with leaves, and you know, they found whatever they could to try to sew together and just, and just cover themselves up. That was the best that they could do. But it wasn't sufficient to God. God says, no, 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 you need something more than that. And this is all symbolic as well, I believe, of salvation. You know, that, that their own works, their own efforts to try to cover their shame just wasn't good enough. It wasn't going to cut it. So God had to step in and provide the coats for them. But what's also uh, interesting, we we'll also make note of, is that he made coats of skins. So it's that skins of animals. So in order for them to be properly clothed and have their nakedness properly covered, blood had to be shed. Those, you can't skin an animal and keep them alive, right? It, it, you know, when, you, when you shave a, 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 you know, a, a sheep and you get their wool and you, you, know, you can make fabric off that, you can make, lin, you, you make, you know, make clothing out of that, it doesn't say that he shaved an animal here. It says he got their skin. You skin an animal that's a different story. You, they have to die for that. Blood has to be shed for that, which is obviously representative, symbolic of the blood that needed to be shed to pay for our sins, yeah. right? So we need to be clothed upon. We need to have Jesus' righteousness put upon us in order for us to be saved, in order for our shame and our guilt and our nakedness to be covered. We need that on us. Amen. So even going back to Adam and Eve, of course, this is the way of salvation. This is the way that things work. Uh, we see it more symbolically back then, but it's the same truth. And, and it's the same exact thing that we know very well today. Now, turn if you would to, I'm going to go a little bit out of order of my notes. Turn if you would to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And as I mentioned, this, you know, this teaching... It impacts other doctrines. And this understanding of, of, you know, first of all, I mentioned, I believe that every name starts off in the book of life. Because if your name is not in the book of life, you go to hell. For, that's very clear. And we're going we're gonna to look at all those references a little bit later, but Revelation 20, um, 
you know, the Bible is very clear at the Great White Throne Judgment. It says, that, you know, everybody whose name is not written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So the big question is, well, what happens to babies? What happens to infants? What happens to those that they clearly are not putting their faith on Jesus Christ to save them? They don't even know any, they don't know any better, right? Well, 2 Samuel chapter 12 shows us, first and foremost, that babies, children, you know, a baby that dies in the womb or a baby that dies just after birth, they clearly go to heaven. They clearly are not going to hell. They, they you know, God has, has uh, they don't, well, I'm going to get into that in a minute. Let's just look at the scripture first real quick. You know, everything ought to be proved from scripture. Right, if the scripture said that there was, you know, infants or babies that are going to hell, then we'd have to deal with that. And, th you know, if that's reality, if that's the way things are, then that is what it is. But the scripture never says that. In fact, it says the opposite. And it makes sense with everything else that the scripture talks about uh, just in general here. Look at verse number 19 of 2 Samuel chapter 12. The Bible says, but when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. And this was after David had committed adultery and murder with Uriah the, Uriah the Hittite's wife, Bathsheba. He, he, you know, he saw her, he laid with her, he committed adultery, and then she became pregnant, and, and he killed Uriah, you know, and this is now what happens. He marries her, and when it comes time, you know, she, she has the child, you know, God has, has said, like, well, you know, you're basically going to be judged, you'll be cursed for this. And David is praying and praying and praying and praying, you know, hoping, begging God for mercy, not to, not to kill a child. But the child dies. So he was, you know, he's fasting, he's doing all this stuff, and everyone was watching him. And here we pick up in the story, verse number 19 says, But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said to the servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he re required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. So he was fasting, and he was just really upset and really intense and praying, and his servants were looking at him going like, man, if he's this distraught and this upset and, you know, and doing all this while the baby's still alive, what is he going to do when we tell him the baby's dead? And it's not what they expected because once he found out that the child was dead, there was no more purpose for him to be begging God to save the child's life if the child was already dead. There's no, no more any reason to be doing all of the fasting and everything that he was trying to do to entreat for the child. So, you know, he, he picks himself up, he cleans himself off, and he breaks his fast, and he, you know, when he, and he, when he gets all settled, obviously he's still sad and mourning, but it's, it's you know, there's nothing more, no more purpose for him to be spent just entreating God for, for the life of the child. The life is already dead. And they kind of don't, don't understand it because they think it's all just out of grief when really he's, you know, it's, he's trying to actually get through to the Lord to, um, to save that child. Uh, and then verse 21 says, Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. So they're confused, like, well, what? Why are you acting like, why are you going to eat now when we tell you the child's dead? And this is what he says, verse 22. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? He said, well, I mean, there's still hope then. The child might still live. So, of course, I'm going to, you know, fast and weep and, and, and try to do all this. He says, but now, verse 23, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Well, why should I fast anymore? There's nothing, nothing else is going to come of that. Can I bring him back again? Right? Obviously, the answer is No. Look what he says here. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And the reason why it's an important phrase is because, you know, he's going to go to him. We know that King David is saved. David knows that he's saved. You know, David trusted in the Lord well before this. It's not like we're reading about him being unsaved at this point. He's saved. If, if, if that child, if there's any question or doubt that that child went to hell, he couldn't say, well, I'm going to go to him. Because if you're saved, you don't ever go to hell. You're not, you're not going to be in hell at all. Knowing that the child is in heaven, he's saying, well, you know what? I'm going to go to him, but he's not going to come back to me. I mean, he's already there. So, so this is scriptural evidence showing us, at least in this one instance, that 
you know, this child that died and, and the child that was born of sin, right? It was a child that was conceived in adultery, still went to heaven. Again, demolishing another false doctrine of the, the original sin, depending on what your definition is of that. Some people define original sin as saying that basically all of mankind is guilty because of Adam's sin. That that, 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 that guilt carries forward for every generation. And we don't believe that here. I don't, I don't believe that for one second. Now, I do believe that there's a, we have a sinful nature that we inherit that you know, drives us to sin, that, that we have a flesh that desires sinful things. But be very clear, the Bible also teaches that we're all ultimately individually responsible for our own actions and for the decisions that we make. And while our flesh may drive us to sin, we are still responsible for what we do and we are not held responsible for what other people have done. God's not going to hold you responsible or guilty for what the sin that someone else committed, unless you have some authority or responsibility over that person, you, you might share some blame, but he's not going to do it just like, you know, as a child, your parent does something, you know, you, you don't just get the blame for that. And I'm, I, I've, I've preached that before. We go through the scripture and show from the law, like that, that the child, you know, that the, the son's not going to die for the sins of, the, of his, his father and, um, and vice versa. You know, people are responsible for their own actions and that's the way God's law works. So when it comes to this child being born, born, even born of sin, the child was still innocent. And this is where these false doctrines, false beliefs come from, from other so-called Christian beliefs of baptizing babies. This is, this is the whole purpose behind the, the infant baptism of the Catholic Church, because Catholic Church teaches, you know, in, that this original sin concept well, they might go to purgatory for a while, so we need to make sure that we baptize these babies and have these christenings, you know, early on as one of the sacraments to help, you know, help them to be able to, to spiritually be saved. And, I, you know, that's ridiculous. We don't believe that baptism does anything for salvation at all. Uh, that's just another work. But you can see how these concepts, if you don't have this right, can, can lead you into other bad doctrine and, 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 and falsehood. So people who think that your names can get added to the book of life after you get saved, well, what happens to the babies? That their name, you know, they didn't get saved. Like this child didn't get saved. This child didn't put its faith on Jesus, didn't trust the Lord, it didn't even know any better. I mean, this is like a newborn. Obviously, though, for him to go to heaven, his name had to be written in the book of life. It is in the book of life. It's, it just hasn't been removed from the book of life. And, you know, this also supports Scripture where the Bible says that, you know, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it's God's desire, it's God's will that, that everybody is saved. And God doesn't want anyone to die and go to hell. Uh, especially not some, some child that dies in the womb or just, you know, an infant that dies. They're innocent. Just as Adam and Eve were innocent until they broke God's laws, they understood it, they had this knowledge come to them, that's when they became guilty. Uh, it's the same way with children. Now, turn back, turn if you were to Romans chapter 7. I'm going to show you even further proof of this concept. And this is all before we get into all the scripture that, that references the book of life. I just want to show you that these principles are here. Romans 7, I think, is extremely clear. It adds a lot of clarity just directly from scripture as to these, the consequences for sin and this spiritual death happening, not a physical death happening. And, and how it occurs that we end up becoming unsaved as a result of our sin and that little children, infants, are not even capable of sinning because they don't even know the law, they don't understand, they don't have enough uh, cognitive comprehension to, to understand right from wrong or anything like that. I mean, you say a baby's crying. You know, parents don't like it when babies cry because it could you know, add stress and everything else. But a baby's crying is not sinful. 
right? Like a little baby is crying because it needs something. And it needs, you know, <laughs> it's actually a very good mechanism that the Lord gave to, to children that when they need something, they make a lot of noise, right? Because you don't always know when your child's hungry. You don't always know when the child needs to be changed or whatever. So that's the, the, the baby's response. Hey, something's not right, so it screams. And, and it, you know, this is uh, maybe kind of silly, but um, I think in, um, what is it, Away in a Manger, the song, like it says, a little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I think it's just trying to make it sound like, well, oh, yeah, baby Jesus was so perfect that he didn't even cry. Like, I don't believe that, okay? I, like, I like the song. Okay, it's a nice song, Christmas song, but it's not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, it's definitely not scripture, let's put it that way. <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, that shows through, I think, also from, uh, from the, the, the Protestant, you know, Catholic Martin Luther that wrote that song. But let's, let's look at Romans chapter 7. Verse number four, the Bible says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So this is explaining... Uh, how, you know, the, the sinful actions that we do, they bring forth fruit unto death. Verse 6, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. And look at verse 9. This is key. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Now, when he's talking about I died. He's not talking about a physical death there either. He's talking about the wages of sin being death. He says, I was alive without the law once because when you don't know the law, you know, God has written the law in our hearts. We have a conscience. We have an understanding of right from wrong. Infants, babies, little, little, little children that don't, they don't understand right from wrong. They don't know the law. They don't, you know, they have no understanding of this. They're alive. They're alive without the law. Because it's not until you sin that you die. And without any knowledge whatsoever of the law, just having no understanding of right and wrong, you can't be held responsible for anything that you, that you do. You know, um, and, and you think about it, little kids, like what sins are they really committing anyways? You know, it's not, you look at, think about the law of God, they're not really doing anything that bad. Now, obviously, as they get a little bit older, they can learn how to lie. They can learn how to do some things that, uh, that are sinful. But even still, there's going to come a point in time where they're finally going to get that understanding where they, where they lose their innocence and, and become responsible for their own actions. Now, I don't know the exact time that that happens. Um, I don't think that you can dogmatically say that. You know, some people say, well, it happens at this age. Or th you can't say what age. Everybody develops a little bit differently. Some people have mental handicaps. Some people have other things that, that prevent their maturity as far as understanding goes. But I'll say this. One, God is just, right? And we know that God is just. It would be unjust for God to just take some baby and cast a baby into hell. Obviously, um, he doesn't do that. And I would say I think the closest metric that we have, according to Scripture, is akin to... Adam and Eve being naked and not thinking there's anything wrong with that and not understanding the shame of that and then getting the knowledge and understanding, whoa, okay, we need to cover ourselves. That was kind of the big event. There's also that, that change that happens in children where they start to understand that they shouldn't be naked in front of people that I brought up earlier. I think that's probably around the time 
that God would start to hold someone responsible for their actions is when they actually become aware of the fact that there's this right and wrong, and that would be probably a, a pretty fair age to say, okay, they know enough. You know, obviously by that point, they're already talking and communicating and things like that as, as, as a child, um, and they're starting to understand more more things and anyone who has children knows like especially if you try to you try to to share the gospel with your children and i encourage you know from a young age you know oftentimes you can see they just don't get it at all even and i don't i don't mean in the sense that you know we talk to people who are unsaved adults and they don't get the gospel but that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about like they're just have no clue of comprehension, like not even on the same page at all. You could ask them a question, they just give you some off the wall, bizarre answer. It doesn't really make any sense at all. It's because their understanding isn't there yet about these things. These concepts aren't formed yet to, to, to even be able to get a good understanding. So um, this verse though in Romans chapter seven, and, and this collection of verses, right, this passage, where he says, you know, without the law, sin's dead. He says, uh, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. So the sin is what kills, but the sin comes from the commandment. And if there is no law, if you didn't understand any law, then, then there's no sin. And that's in our, you know, in part of our Romans 4 passage. Too. I'm not going to turn there, but... Um, that you know without the law there there is no sin and wrath comes by the law uh turn now if you would to let's see because i'm going out of order in my notes turn to john chapter 3. So because by breaking the law, we die, and that's a spiritual death, we need a spiritual birth in order to be saved, which is what Jesus describes in John chapter 3 when he's speaking to Nicodemus, talking about being born again, right? Because spiritually, we're dead. When you, when you sin and you don't have Christ, you know, you're, you, you, you die as a result. John chapter 3, verse number 3, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So, obviously, you have a, you have a physical birth, a fleshly birth, and then you have a spiritual birth. Uh, that spiritual birth is what we need. Why do we need that? Because our spirit died when uh, you sin and, and knowing the law, the law, uh, you, you're, you know, you're punished according to that sin. Now, uh, and, and don't be confused either when I say because you knew the law. I'm not referring to someone who's just an adult and say, they, they, well, they've never read the law of God from the Bible. Because God has written his law into our hearts. And that, you know, we're all without excuse. So people know, you know when you do wrong, even if you didn't ever actually read the law or had someone read the law to you, God still holds us responsible. There's enough evidence in creation. God's put enough evidence out there for his existence as well as just um, for our right and wrong to understand, you know, that we are in trouble. We need a savior. Now, obviously, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's where your faith is going to come from. But the, the guiltiness of your sin, once you're able to understand right from wrong, everybody gets to that point, regardless of your upbringing and regardless of, of knowing what the Bible says about it, we all have that written in our hearts. So um, I, I'm starting to think now, I realize there's even more points that I could be proving from Scripture but I don't have everything here. I want to get into the book of life now. Turn if you would to Exodus chapter 32. But you can see how all these little details, you say, at the end of the day, does it really matter when a person's name is written in the book of life? Just standing all by itself, 
Does that really matter? Not so much, right? If someone says, well, I think your name gets written the moment you, you believe or whatever, okay, whatever. But, but here's the thing where it matters is when you start going through and, and dealing with all these other issues and uh, uh, doctrines, for example, you know, the, like with the baby, well then, okay, then what happens if, you know, what happens with the baby? If your name only gets added when you get saved, what about that? And then what about, you could say, oh, well, maybe the, maybe the name starts there, and then it gets taken out, then it gets added again. Fair enough, right? That's a fair point, but show me then where the name is getting added. And this is what we're going to do now. We're going to look at these mentions to the Book of Life. I do turn to Exodus 32, right? So we're going we're to look at these various references to the Book of Life, and I want you to just pay special attention as we go through this to what is happening to the names? Are they already there? Are they being removed? Are they being added? Just think about that concept as we go through each one of these references. What is it actually saying? Now, some of them, you know, you can't tell if they're, you know, exactly what's going on just based on the reference. But we're going we're gonna to see it. We're going to look at each one of these. Exodus 32, look at verse number 31. The Bible reads, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin. And he stops mid-sentence there. He's, you know, he's kind of asking if, you, if you'll forgive their sin. He says, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Now, this doesn't specifically say the book of life, but we could infer that this is a book of life, and I'm including some passages like this that don't specifically say book of life, but I think it's fair enough to infer that it is. And it's still going to be consistent with every other passage anyways that specifically talks about the book of life. So that's why I'm including this, just for, just for your own information or what, what we're looking at. Um, so he's asking here, if he's not going to forgive their sin, to blot him out of his book, which I'm going to say this is the book of life. He's saying, you know what, just remove me out. So this tells us that Moses at least believes his name is in the book at this point. Right? It's not added later. It was already there. Now, we don't know when it was added from this passage, but at least he's saying, you know what? Just take me out. Just blot my name out. Right? He's asking to be removed. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So again, this also disproves the, uh, and turn if you go to Daniel chapter 12, this also disproves the, the concept of that original sin making you not saved or have your name not in the book of life because of what other people have done. He says, no, 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 no. Him that sins, like, like that's the person I'm going to blot out, not you. You can't, I'm not going to blot your name out for anybody else, is what God's saying here. Right? Even if you want that, like it's, he's not going to do that. You don't get to make a deal <laughs> on this stuff with the book of life with God. Okay. Now, obviously, Moses is just showing his heart. I don't think he really wanted to be reprobated and, and cast to hell, but... You know, I mean, he's, he, he really is not treating. He has that mindset. He's also, he has a mind of Christ where he is being selfless towards other people, right? Daniel chapter 12, we're going to see another reference here. Verse number one, the Bible reads, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. This is clearly, I think, talking about, you know, end times, talking about that great trouble, talking about great tribulation that's going to come on the earth. That wasn't uh, since that time. This is exactly what the great tribulation is, des is described at. And then verse 2 says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So it's talking about events, you know, resurrection of the end of the world. It's all about people being, you know, being resurrected unto eternal life or to, um, to death. And it says that the people who are delivered, their names are in the book. So, again, this reference, though, it's, it's making reference to the book, but we're not seeing a name being added or removed. It's already found written in the book. Fair enough? Okay, so this doesn't really help us out much at all as far as when do names go or when do they come out because it's just saying everyone whose name is there. 
Psalm 69. Turn if you would to Psalm 69. And I, I'm, I'm trying to be exhaustive with this, just so we can see. I'm not, leave, I'm not trying to leave anything out. Okay, so if you find some reference later on I left out, it's by mistake, by me not being thorough enough of getting it in here. But, you know, I, this, is, this is as thorough as I could be. If I miss something, I apologize for that. I'm not trying to exclude any reference. I want to look at all of them so we can get the right, um, the right view of, 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 this, of this teaching. Psalm 69, verse number 20, the Bible reads, Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. And this is, you know, this is a prophecy of Jesus Christ who's on the cross. Verse 21, they gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare before them. And that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness. Verse 28, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. So there, the book of the living, I think it's fair enough to say that's the book of life. Right, the book of the living, book of life. And this is referring to names being blotted out of the book of life, which means that their names were in the book of life already in order for them to be blotted out of the book of life. They had to be there. Now, this opens up a whole other aspect, and I'm not going to teach on eternal security. We already, hopefully, already established in that what you believe about that. We don't believe that anybody can lose their salvation. Okay, we don't believe that you can be saved and then later on become unsaved through some action that you do, some sin that you commit, because that implies a works-based salvation. The Bible is very clear. It's not of works. So if someone's name is being blotted out of the book of life, it had to be there to begin with, but this, goes, this speaks to the fact that I believe that every name starts in the book of life I believe when a person gets saved, that's impossible then to blot your name out of the book of life. That salvation seals it and secures it. But until you're saved, your name may still be there, but it can always come out. So if, you're, you, know, if you die without Christ, your name's removed from the book of life. If you become reprobate before you die, your name is blotted out of the book of life. It's taken out. But it was there to begin with because the Lord's not willing that any should perish. God wants everyone to be saved from the time you're a child until you, um, until you, you know, can't. And, and this is also, I think, you know, even though when you sin, you're dead, you still have that place in the book of life because you can still be saved. And hopefully that makes sense to you. Let's turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. Now we're going to get into the New Testament. And almost all the references to the book of life, by the way, are in Revelation. That's almost all of them. We're looking at these few passages that kind of make references to them. But we're going to find the book of Revelation as by far the most. So far, what we've seen is Exodus talks about, you know, Moses saying his name being blotted out, and God saying he's not going to do that. Daniel 12 talks about just names already being found in the book. Psalm 69 talks about names being removed, blotted out. Philippians 4, verse 3, the Bible says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers who na whose names are in the book of life. So that is a reference to people whose names are there, right? So again, not saying when they were added, but they're not removed. Um, that doesn't help, again, to, to, as to when names are added. Go to Revelation, Revelation chapter 3. But it's a reference to the book of life.
Verse number 5 of Revelation chapter 3. Barbara, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, this is interesting because verse 5 says, He that overcometh, now, the Bible also says, you know, who is he that overcometh the world, but um, he that believeth on the Son of God, right? It's, it's your faith that makes you overcome. So this isn't talking about works, which is also why it's saying it's the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Well, you're clothed in the white raiment because you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. So this is talking about people who get saved. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and... I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. To this, this implies to me that when the person gets saved, their name was already in the book of life, but he's saying, I'm not going to blot you out anymore. Can you see that? I mean, it's, but I'm going to confess his name before my father and before the, his angels. And we're still just seeing a reference to a removal of a name, not an addition. If your name gets added to the book of life when you get saved, it would have said, and I will add his name to the book of life. Because this is specifically talking about he that overcometh, you're going to be clothed in white raiment, and your name will be in the book. He's saying, no, your name is not going to be blotted out. I think for very good reason he, he uses that language, because he could have used some other language as well that, was, that would be more ambiguous, but this specifically says it won't be removed. Revelation chapter 13 is our next reference. Revelation chapter 13, verse number 8. And I probably should have added more context to this, but Revelation 13, verse 8. I'm going to want more than what's in my notes to go through this. The Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Talking about worshiping the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So this isn't saying that, that uh, these names are being removed right now. It says they're already not written in the book of life. So they either weren't there to begin with or they've been removed. Right? Those are only two options. From everything we've seen so far, names are getting blotted out. This is also referring to people who worship the dragon, worship the beast, where the Bible also very clearly says in Revelation 14, verse number, uh, verse number 9. Let's look at that. Verse number 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So, I like showing this to people about the reprobate doctrine, that there are people who are alive, but they can no longer be saved, because this is an example of someone if you, you know, there's, there's multiple things you could do. One, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, the Bible says you have never forgiveness, neither in this life, neither in, li neither in the life to come. That, that you are just, you, you have no hope, no chance of forgiveness because you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. The Bible also says at the end of Revelation, and, you know, we might as well turn there now. Look at Revelation chapter 22. Because this speaks to the same exact thing. Verse number 18, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So again, if someone tampers with the Bible, adds to the prophecy, removes from the word of God, he's saying, I'm going to remove uh, take away, specifically what it says, take away his part out of the book of life. So there's another reference to just removal, not addition, removal. You've, your, your spot is gone in that book of life. You've been blotted out because you did these things. It stands to reason, 
it's the same exact thing when a person takes the mark of the beast your name is blotted out and this is in Revelation 13 is making a more general statement of everyone that dwells on the earth whose names are not written in the book of life uh, they're worshiping him why because the first time that they took the mark or the first time that they that they do that they become remember their name is blotted out so now all that are worshiping the beast and have his mark all of them their names are not written in the book of life because they've already been blotted out from the very moment that they took the mark of the beast Does that makes sense I mean to me it makes sense I, I, I that's what it that's what it seems like the Bible is teaching here verse number or chapter number 20 in Revelation look at chapter number 20 We almost exhausted all the references of the book of life, but there's a few more left. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 11, but I, was in, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, I believe when it says the books here, I believe it's talking about the books of the Bible. I think it's talking about the Bible. The Bible is a compilation of books, right? The books of the Bible. Why? They're judged according to the works, according to the law of God. Because without Christ, you're going to be judged according to the law, right? And that's why you've got the books of the law and you've got the book of life. So, when the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened, and then the other book is opened, which is the book of life, the dead are judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. The dead, because they have no eternal life, because their names are not written in the book of life. And that's why you've got them open side by side. Let's see, who's standing before me now? Oh, yeah, your name's not in the book of life, so we're going to the books. You did this, 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 this. This is why you're burning in hell and you're cast in the lake of fire. Who's saying before we now? Oh, your name's in the book of life. Okay. You're not judged out of the books. I mean, this is, this is that, that judgment. And verse number 13 says, uh, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the book of life obviously is very important to understand about the book of life because hey if your name's not there you know you're going you're going to lake of fire um but even just understanding when a name is added or removed and how that all works helps us because it impacts many other doctrines i already covered most of them now um real quickly revelation 21 verse 27 the second to last reference we're going to look at the Bible says, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, again, the names are there already. If, if your name is found there, then you have access to the New Jerusalem. You get access to this new heaven, new earth. You know, you're, you're, you're in. You're good. Now, turn, if you would, to Revelation 17. We're just going to go back a little bit. I, I saved this reference for last because for everything that I've been teaching this morning on this subject, this is the one verse that could be problematic for everything. But I wanted to show you all of the evidence and all of the reasoning first because if you have, just like with anything, if you have a mountain of evidence stating one thing, and then you come across another one that might sound a little bit like, well, I don't know, this kind of sounds like this might be saying something else. You, you got to be able to weigh everything and understand the ramifications of, well, what if this is true? What if, you know, just uh, the real simple example is James chapter 2, you know, faith without works is dead. Well, does that mean that then, well, we have to have works in order to be saved? Well, look, you've got a mountain of scriptures that clearly teach you that salvation is by grace through faith. It's not of works. As any man should be, you know, I mean, there's so many. You go down the line. You could look at, you evaluate it, and then you come across this one, and you're going, oh, wow, I don't really know what that means. It kind of sounds like it might be saying this. It's clearly not. If you, if you think that's talking about works, works are required to be saved eternally, 
then you don't understand that passage. Because if that's what it's saying, then you've got contradiction in Scripture, and, you, and then you've got a, a really big problem. So I leave this one for last, because I could understand if you're looking at this, and you look at this one verse, I could understand you coming up with a different conclusion than what I'm teaching off of this one verse. But let's read it. Verse number 8, Revelation chapter 17. The Bible says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So this is, say, this is saying, you know, it's talking about this group of people, they that dwell on the earth, and the people who are wondering, it says their names were not written in the book of life. But then that phrase, from the foundation of the world, I think is what can throw you off. Because you're thinking, well, what, does that mean that their names were never in the book of life? I mean, going to the foundation of the world, their names were never in the book of life. And I would say, that's not what this verse is saying. Okay? Now, if that is what it was saying, that already contradicts, because this is talking about the people who are, essentially, they're worshiping the beast. Because it's talking about the beast ascending out of the bottomless pit, going into perdition, and they dwell on the earth. Um, it says, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is, we see in the other passage that, you know, their names are taken out. They're blotted out. Um, and everywhere we see names being blotted out that were already there. This would be the only instance and the only occurrence where it would be like, oh, well, this group of people, their name was never there from the beginning. But that, that is not the way any other passage works. So, so how can we understand this passage in light of everything else? Can this still be consistent with what I'm teaching? Yes, it can, because it's the book of life that has existed from the foundation of the world. So the book of life is from the foundation of the world, but... When it's talking about this group of people, their names were not written in it at this time. The time that's referring to this event happening, their names were not written, they're not found written in, you know, another way of saying their names were not written in it, their names were not found in the book of life, right? You can, you can, you know, essentially, grammatically, it's saying the same thing, but by saying their name were not found there is the same thing as saying their names were not written in the book of life because they weren't written at that time. It doesn't mean they weren't ever written. They were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Again, it's the book of life is from the foundation of the world. The book of life has always existed. I believe the book of life has always existed at the foundation of the world. Every name of every person who's ever existed was going, you know, the foundation of the world, no one's existed yet. So it contained every name. And, and think about this. If, if your name could only get added when you get saved or something like that, then no names would be in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Do you see what I mean? Like, that how, how could your name then be added? And, you know, there's no evidence to ever think anything other than the names were already there. You could say, well, maybe a name gets added when you're born, and then it gets taken out, and then it gets added again. There is no adding. There's no adding. Which is also, you know, it's a lot of similar arguments made about losing your salvation. You know, people who think you lose your salvation and you get re-saved against that. Well, the Bible never talks about that. Bible, first of all, never talk about losing your salvation, but the passages that are misconstrued to be talking about people who lose their salvation, when you read those passages, they, they usually say, well, you can never be saved anyways. Like, it's, it's a permanent thing. So the people who become reprobate you know, the people who believe you can lose your salvation, they'll point to those passages and say, oh, yeah, well, see, this is how you can lose your salvation. You know, if you tamper with the word of God or if you take the mark of bees or whatever, they're like, well, that's how you can lose your salvation. But no, they, they're talking about you're never saved then after that. You blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you can never be saved. People who teach you could lose your salvation, they look at that and say, oh, yeah, see, look, you could be saved and lose your salvation. But then you ask that same person, well, then can you get saved again? Oh, yeah, you just got to trust Jesus. You know, it's like, well, no, because that passage says you, can, you never have forgiveness. So you, you just got to read, you know, one, reason this out, but when you, when you compare the passages, I think it's pretty clear. 
I think it shows the heart of God that God wants everyone to be saved. I think it's consistent with what happens with, with children, with infants, with people in the womb. You know, when they die, hey, their name's already in the book of life. And we know that your name has to be in the book of life in order to not go to the second death, in order to not be cast in the lake of fire. So the name has to be there. And there's plenty of people who are innocent because they haven't committed any sins. They were alive once without the law. But they haven't committed any sin to be dead. I think it's pretty clear. And like I said, if someone believes a little bit different on this, is that alone just like, oh man, we can't fellowship? No, of course not. But I would just say be careful and think this all the way through because it does have other ramifications and other doctrines. You need to be consistent with everything that you believe, which is why I, you know, I'm, I'm teaching on this at all this morning. And uh, hopefully you can see that. I don't know. I'm, I, sometimes I don't feel like I'm always as clear with my words as I'd like to be. But um, hopefully that, that sheds a little bit of light on that subject. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for, um, for the Bible. We thank you for providing these truths to us. We thank you for the book of life and for, um, for loving us enough that you can secure our place in the book of life when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we know for a fact that it's there, regardless of when it was there, dear Lord. Um, we thank you for, for not allowing us to be blotted out uh, because of, of, especially because of what other people do. Lord, I pray that you please just help us to understand more, um, just more from your word, more doctrine, the things that we need to know. Lord, open up our, our eyes and our understanding and help us to teach others uh, these great truths that, that we have learned. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.